Hi, I'm Dave Eicher, editor of Astronomy Magazine. Welcome to the fifth Cosmos Rewind Google Hangout, sponsored by Celestron. We're very thankful for Celestron, their telescopes, and their support of this venture. This past episode from the weekend of Cosmos, a space-time odyssey, was titled Hiding in the Light, and it featured a history of how we've come to understand the properties of light and how it's enlightened our knowledge of the universe. There's a lot to talk about in terms of physics here and astronomy and astrophysics and the birth of astrophysics, uh, but before we get going, let me introduce our distinguished panelists of the week. Uh, they include Bill Andrews, the associate editor of Discover. Great to see you, Bill. You too, Dave. Corey Powell, the editor-at-large of Discover. Great to see you, as always, Corey. Nice to be here. Liz Cruzy, associate editor of Astronomy. Thanks for being with us, Liz. She really loves light, by the way. <laughs> yeah, she, she, she even reflects it. That's how, that's how much she loves yeah. it. <laughs> and myself. And so before we get going, we're going to go back to Bill, and Bill is going to give us an episode summary of what we saw this week before we kick off the discussion. All right. Thanks, Dave. So as you said, uh, you kind of gave the summary summary, so I'll break it down a little bit more. Uh, so now this was a story all about how when light gets flipped and turned upside down, it can end up opening a door into understanding the universe. Uh, Neil said in the beginning that we'd be visiting three people, an ancient Chinese philosopher, a wizard who amazed the caliphs of 11th century Iraq, a poor German orphan enslaved to a harsh master. And each of those guys helped us unlock the secrets hidden in light. So after visiting some nameless cave people transfixed by a camera obscures light show, we visit the first of that trio, Mo Tzu of ancient China, whose progressive scientific ideas were great for understanding the universe, but not so great at complying with Emperor Qin's strict authority. The man never likes being questioned, and so the animated sequence shows us the world's first book burning, and Neil intones, it would be another thousand years before the next movie. Next up was the wizard from the trio, Ibn al-Hazen of Basra, Iraq, who lived during Islam's golden age of science, from which we get the al in algebra, algorithm, alcohol, etc. And, and we also get our so-called Arabic numerals there from then, as Neil reminded us. Al Hazen not only was the first person ever to set down the rules of science, as Neil informed us, he also uh, learned how to create a camera obscura with a small opening for light in an otherwise dark tent. A pretty illuminating fellow, it would seem. And so finally, we moved on to the third of the initial trio of those masters of light. We moved on to Joseph Fraunhofer. Uh, despite a drudgerous youth, he would grow up to make awesome telescopes and invent <laughs> astrophysics, as Neil Tyson emotionally put it, by analyzing the black shadows in a rainbow spectrum that indicate an object's chemical makeup. Uh, from then, we see a long sequence showing how this works at the atomic level with the electrons and the nucleus and some fun stuff and the light that it shows, and it got very interesting. And finally, Neil concluded the show by emphasizing what a powerful tool this spectroscopy was for understanding the universe, being able to see different parts of it with different kinds of light. Uh, the episode also included a lot of fun other stuff, including long digressions on sound waves and sound. Uh, there were a few more fires that Neil Tyson sat and stood in front of. Uh, he got to chastise Isaac Newton for being a fool and eating his dinner instead of discovering spectroscopy. And uh, dark matter even made an appearance, so to speak. So it was a pretty busy, but in general, fairly enlightening episode, I would say. Well played. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bill. And before we get going in all sorts of different directions here, I, I think it was interesting, and it was to me a little bit surprising that this was an episode that seemed to go in a number of different directions, and, and you sort of felt like you were moving in different directions and weren't quite sure uh, whether everything was really going to connect 
up at the end, and, and I thought it was great. It was really good history. It was compelling. Uh, I was a little surprised that the strong focus on historical characters continued as it did, because so much of this uh, had been discussed uh, in the original Cosmos, and, and here I just have to wonder, just, you know, because it'll give us a little something to talk about. I mean, here we have, there are a lot of things that are explosively important uh, developments in astrophysics and cosmology and planetary science that we really didn't know about or just had a, a faint clue in 1980. Uh, let me just read a few. How the Sun Will Die, Why Mars Went uh, Cold and Dry, the Milkamada uh, Collision, what we really know about the nature of the Big Bang, exoplanets, the Milky Way as a barred spiral, why Venus turned itself inside out, and you can go on and on and on. Um, will, will the series be getting to some of the th huge developments that have taken place uh, in the last uh, 30 years? I, I'd like to uh, hope that it will, and maybe it will in future episodes, but does anyone want to talk about sort of how this episode was constructed and the journey that it's taking you uh, in looking at historical figures and the theme of light? Yeah, I, I thought it was interesting exactly what you were saying, that, that you know, the emphasis on the show so far has really been about understanding the scientific process, understanding the scientific journey, and especially hitting this theme of uh, freedom of thought, freedom of inquiry, that, you know, of, of sort of the open questioning of rules as one of the, the hallmarks of, of uh, the scientific mindset. And so far, that's been the focus of Cosmos at least as much as the, uh, you know, as the, as the explorations of sort of where the, where the cutting edge science is right now. And I thought, you know, this this episode was interesting in that, you know, it it really, you know, the the, the thematic tie was light um, as a phenomenon and light as a metaphor, as 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 is you know, as the process of of intellectual exploration. And it really, I mean, this episode, I think, probably the most of the ones that have aired so far, really was metaphorically about the the discovery process more more than it was really about kind of where science is right now. Uh, that said, I thought you know it covered a lot of really interesting history, and we'll, we'll get into that, including a number of historical figures who I think are probably not even all that well known to a lot of scientists, and certainly not to the general public. Now, Liz, you really liked this episode, didn't you? I did, and I feel um, feel kind of like I'm in the minority here, at least on the staff of Astronomy and Discover. I, I liked it because I think it did a great job of explaining what light is and why it's so important for astronomers to study and what it can show and what it can tell. And it didn't, the episode didn't go into specifically what has come out of those studies. Um, there was a bit of a hint of it at the end with dark matter, and there's a ton more where that came from, because each region of light, each region of radiation can tell you something new about objects that you already know about or of completely new objects. Um, but I, I really I liked it, and I, I liked the metaphors into, you know, when we were at the church, um, and we were looking at the organs and the sound waves, because I thought that that really, the fact that sound waves and light waves have a similarity, and they both have wavelengths, they both have amplitude, um, and I, I liked that that matchup. I thought it really worked, but I, I guess I'm in the minority here, so... <laughs> no, I, I actually agree with you. Um, yeah, and I think, uh, sorry to, to jump in again, but I think one of the things that the episode did really powerfully was it conveyed just what a strange thing light is. And I think that's you know that that's the that is the one of the most powerful things that a show like this can do is make you look at the familiar in an unfamiliar way. And you know, light is you know vision is the primary way that we are aware of the world around us. Um, and yet light is such a tiny, tiny sliver of the different types of radiation that are out there. Um, and you know, as astronomy has opened up and looked at radio waves and X-rays and, and ultraviolet, each time it's it's opened up, we've discovered that there was there were all kinds of phenomena and objects and and aspects of the universe that we hadn't seen before. I thought the episode did a did a nice job of doing that, uh, you know, starting with the discovery of the infrared rays, realizing that there that when you go if you just make a spectrum, there actually is something 
above the blue and below the red, you can't see it, but it's there. And I think that you know that that you know that idea of the ever expanding range of of inquiry in physical distance and in conceptual distance is a really it's a really powerful idea. And I hope if people walk away with one thing from the show, I think that, that idea that you keep questioning and you keep looking beyond what you know, it's a very, very important concept. Bill, what was your take on this episode? Well, I also liked a lot of it, but I think I might be uh, a member of this other majority that Liz was talking about among some of the staffs in that I I wasn't completely sold on the way they approached some of these things. It felt kind of schizophrenic was a word we used a lot and kind of went everywhere a little bit. For me, for instance, the, the digression into sound waves in the church organ and the long pipes felt it just it didn't really work for me. I thought it was kind of going afield, you know, too far afield of what the main focus was. And while there was a lot of stuff that, for me, was really great, showing how some of the, how a prism diffracts light and talking about, you know, above above the blue and below the red, I thought that was great too. And being able to convey uh, what light is, you know, and the weirdness of it and also the importance of science and questioning authority, the main theme, I thought those were all fine, but there was just so much kind of, jumping around to me that it felt a little hard to focus on it and I mean there was there was this one part where suddenly a space baby shows up and and Neil is like and it turns out to be on the the ship of the imagination and Neil plays it like it's no it ain't no thing you know it's oh a space baby and there was this other bit about and and I turned out it was leading up to the grand finale of the ending of being able to hear the symphony of the universe and all the different light oh okay but it was weirdly implemented, you know, partway through the show, you would hear, like, a weird symphonic bit, and, and the light would inverse, and Neil would turn to the camera and say, what was that? Did you hear that? Anyway, where was I? This guy, Fraunhofer. And that was so weird. I really, that really stood out to me. That took me out of things a little bit, and I don't know that that, that worked for me. When he was talking to Isaac Newton and some of the things, and we'll get into this later, in the historical parts, he was interacting with them a lot more, kind of shouting out, like it's in, like in a horror movie, don't go in there. He shouted out to Newton, no, don't put that magnifying glass down. It, it seemed a little hokey to me. I don't know. I I enjoy fun things, and I know that's a lighthearted approach, and it didn't bother me. I mean, in general, it's still a good show, and I'm very glad it's on, and I love that people are watching it, and the fact that you, Liz and Corey, and lots of other people really loved it, I think that's great. But just for me, this one episode, I think, wasn't wasn't my favorite. We can say that. Well, I would agree with you, I think, Bill. I was a little bit taken aback and a little surprised by the flow of this episode and, frankly, by the coverage of it as well. Um, but let me just, to, just to, to, to throw this out here as discussion, <clears throat> you know, we're all people who are very, very intimately uh, involved with, interested in, and believers in science and the way it works, and it's been really, really close to us. We talked earlier a little bit about the scientific method, and, and Corey, you talked about if one thing for a lot of viewers can come out of this, it can really be perhaps changing the way people think about uh, how they perceive reality and the universe a little bit, and sort of hammering and hammering and hammering with examples of the scientific method and, and of historical examples. Maybe, maybe this is, you know, sort of the crucial thing to sort of really, uh, you know, drown people, if you will, in, in how important it is to think in a, what for many, many people is a very, very different way of, of thinking and perceiving the universe and the reality around them. What, what do you think? Yeah, I think I think we're starting to see uh, with each episode a little bit more of the you know, the underlying motivation of what the, what Neil Tyson and really a and Andrew and 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 Stephen Soder, the the writers of the show, what what they're bringing here. Uh, like I said, I, I think you know starting with the with the that long animated sequence of the very first episode, um, and they talked about Giordano Bruno for for what seemed like an oddly long time. I'm starting to see you know, a, a, you know, sort of kind of a, a running theme here that each episode has uh, sort of an undercurrent of the, the importance of freedom of thought and open inquiry. And you know, I think that's why it's been so heavily focused on historical figures, like in, in this episode, uh, talking about, uh, about Motsu and, and Al uh, you know, b both, both figures who are associated with periods of, sort of intellectual openness and enlightenment in their cultures 
um, in cultures that later turned turned against open inquiry and and honestly went into decline. And I think that's a I think that's a that's sort of a running theme that, that open inquiry, the, the free flow of ideas, that the, the, the advancement of science is associated with periods of of cultural growth, economic growth, success, and the periods of harsh ideology and retrenchment are associated with societies in decline. And I think that's a I think that's a very important idea that 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 Neil Tyson and the and the show's writers are trying to convey is that you know, to, to, to try to steer away from this idea of, of science as a as a as a culturally divisive thing or as, as something you know as a topic that people find difficult and intimidating and instead think about it as something that is progressive and liberating and empowering and that ultimately that, that it's you know that I, I think you know it's you know it's just one show It'll be interesting to see what how much impact it can have but I think it's a very interesting approach to to really talk about science the way I would say most scientists think about it uh, and not the way that most people outside the sciences think about it. I think that point was brought up well too. Um, he consistently says question everything and he mentioned a line about how both young children and everyone really wonder why and that is the main question. That's what scientists do. They always want to know why does this happen and what are the methods to get there and so maybe you have to go through a rigorous approach to answer that question but it always was initially sparked by some sort of curiosity that everyone has um, every young kid is curious about the world around them each person is and that's really what science is is learning about the world around us and it doesn't have to be a sterile environment and just a very uptight experience it is just curiosity and learning about everything around and it's just something you can do any day and in any way so but it's learning in a very specific way as, as well um, with observing things and with uh, questioning as we've said and with doing experiments and repeating those observations and experiments and testing things both mentally and in reality with with uh, experiments um, as opposed to believing something because somebody tells you it's true, an authority figure, or because you dream it with your intuition, um, or because you calculate it even in a rational stochastic method with mathematics. You know, each of those has its greater or lesser uh, distance from science. But most people on this planet do not think uh, or, or accept things scientifically, and so maybe the show is going a long, long way to try to make that point because um, most people really aren't in that mode and it seems a little odd because uh, and almost redundant to some of uh, us who were deeply involved in science for many decades. Yeah, and kind of building off of that, that most people don't think this way, I feel like it was at the opening episodes especially, a lot of people thought it was kind of overly aggressive uh, you know, perhaps against religion or a pro-science as if, as if it's a real, you know, war or, or the culture wars and progressives and liberals and all that. And I think now that we've seen it play out, that's a theme in the show, not just, you know, in our personal space, the Republicans or the Democrats or whoever, but, you know, also the ancient Chinese, this is a thing, and when, when the age of science and the Islamic culture, this is just human nature of different ways of seeing the world and I really appreciate how the this modern cosmos doesn't shy away from not exactly being aggressive but from making it stand and saying you know what there are a lot of people who believe things but some other things have evidence behind them and we can talk about them differently than we talk about other things and I think we're so used to in this day and age not seeing something so kind of definitively pro-science and it's very easy to kind of back down and be like well we don't want to offend anybody we'll, we'll soften it we won't bring that stuff up and it's been really interesting seeing this and seeing what a non you know unapologetic approach it takes to just this is how it is this is how scientists see things and science works so draw your own conclusions I think that's great yeah and actually and not just that science works but that science actually gives a, a bigger and grander way of looking at the world. Because again, that's been mm -hmm. a recurring theme. I think in the previous episode, um, we had Neil Tyson explaining that you know, if the world was only 6,000 years old, you'd only be able to see 6,000 light years away. Your universe would be, would be tiny. And 
you know, I think, you know, in, in this in this this episode, uh, I think, you know, it kind of went both all the way down to the scale of the atom to try to understand what what happens with light and sort of all the way out to the to the edge of the universe of what the information that light can bring us. That that idea of that we're we're surrounded by these incredible extremes of scale, um, and that are, you know, that that are really, you know, are, are to to the sci to scientists are are beautiful, powerful things, you know, that, that you know a lot of them describe in even in almost mystical terms. I think the idea that there 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 is this, you know, spiritual for want of a better word, the spiritual side of science, that there is the, there's a connection to a world that's so much grander than the world of traditional religion that uh, that it's you know, that it's that that you know if you look at the the tr you know if every every religion has a creation mythology but the the creation mythology of science and the universe of science is much much larger than all those because all those all those religions arose at a time when we just didn't know about these things so you know science has a universe that is far far grander than than any organized religion is offering and that's a that's a that's an intriguing and unusual way to frame it. And like you said from the very first episode, that's how they've been saying it. Giordano Bruno was quoted as saying, your God isn't big enough. And at the very beginning, that's been a main theme. So it's just been great. And if you'll permit me, I like to think of <clears throat> scientists being uh, analytical. And uh, yet they're, scientists are people, too. At least some people might admit that. Um, but, you know, the word spiritual has, which is fair enough, but it, it so often carries that extra weight of supernaturalism. I, I think I like to think of it as scientists can be quite emotional when they're looking out uh, at a galaxy they know is 100 million light years away. And, and the, the overwhelming awe, as you said, Corey, of the universe is incredible. The natural universe without supernaturalism, but I think that can invoke emotion from scientists without necessarily uh, supernatural feelings that, that evoke or go against the scientific method that we've been talking about. We've got a lot of stuff actually to get to here, um, but Corey, I want to go back to you for a second if I can, because when we think about the term polymath, we almost uh, sort of latch on to long, long, long ago Isaac Newton or his uh, friend and enemy Robert Hooke, Alhazen in the 10th century in Cairo, he was an astronomer, he was a philosopher, he had the whole package that came along with natural philosophy, he was a meteorologist, he was an optician, a mathematician, um, physicist if you will, he, he was one of the very earliest uh, who really rigorously looked at conducting experiments and, and doing things repeatedly in really an empirical way, was he not? And he's a guy who really gets tremendously overlooked. Yes, and I, I think, you know, in, in history of science circles, his name is well known, but I can say, you know, I, mean, I alluded to this earlier, I think, you know, he's not well known, it's not just that he's not well known to the public, I would say he's, he's not well known to most, most scientists. I would say, you know, even if you go all the way down to you know, scientists in astronomy, you have to find people who are, you know, who are sort of attentive to the history of science, who know his name. But as, but as you say he was an incredibly influential figure, um, not only in the ideas that he had, but also in the ideas that he transmitted. This is during the period of this is the height of the, the Islamic Caliphate in Europe, when when Christianity was kind of on the retreat, uh, Islam was on the rise, and Islam was a was a very intellectually and politically progressive force. Uh, in, in northern Africa and Europe, it's you know it's sort of hard to it's hard to imagine those you know those roles today the, the way they were back then. Uh, and so yeah, so here you have Al Hazen who is both preserving the ancient learning and he's also at the same time teaching this very profound message of don't be beholden to the old books and the old scholars. Don't believe something because somebody tells you it's so. You know th th he was pushing you know this uh, you know what. Uh, you know, the roots of what became basically, you know, the Baconian scientific method. So it is. I mean, he's a he is a very you know a very interesting figure. And you know, again, you think of what was happening in Europe in, in the in the tenth century. It was you know there it was a very it was literally you know an intellectually cloistered place where where knowledge was uh, was was preserved, but really was not encouraged to expand. 
uh, where there was not a whole lot of open inquiry, where you know the you know the roots of the of the scientific revolution and the and the Enlightenment were very very far away. And then we can go back even even farther to Moza in fifth uh, century BC China um, and his philosophy as well. Uh, and Neil touched on him. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm going to call him Motsu until somebody tells me not to call him <laughs> Motsu. <laughs> it just, it just sounds better to me. Uh, so yeah, I, I think you know. Look, there, there, there is one problem with the kind of storytelling the cosmos does, and there's really no way around it, which is when you, when you pick out, you know, your heroes, you sort of do a, you know, a great men of science story that, you know, if it hadn't been for this one guy, nothing would have happened. And of course, we know that's not exactly how the world works. Um, and actually, and it has been a great men of science story so far, the, the women have yet to show up, and I'm trusting that, uh, that, that Neil Tyson and his writers actually will get to the fact that there were some towering female figures in the history of astronomy. Well, he touched on dark matter, but didn't get into what dark matter could be. But that'll well, inevitably lead to a Vera Rubin sighting. Right. I, I think I think there will be a dark matter episode, and I'm confident that Vera Rubin's going to be in there. So I'm 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 holding out hope. But look, uh, you know, so yeah, see, Motsu, who was who was you know, a predecessor of Confucius, um, he was a very progressive philosopher. Um, he was he also constructed what we think is you know, the history's first camera obscura, um, essentially a pinhole camera. Um, and, and you know, then you know, Neil Tyson intones that, uh, you know, that you know, after, after his ideas were largely lost, that you know, it would take a thousand years to get back there. But of course, Aristotle was born less than a century after, actually I think it was, he was born just a couple decades after the death of, of Motsu, so it wasn't really like the whole world stopped after Motsu. You know, that's the, that's the downside of, you know, when you, when you pick your, your interesting heroes, you kind of you end up telling a slightly, I mean, it's literally you know, a bit of a comic book version of history, um, which is, you know, it's, it's, you know, far be it for me to, to, to knock the show for bringing into the light historical figures who most people would never have heard of and, you know, you know who give a sense of the incredible uh, progress that's come before us. Um, we have to remember that even these characters are just kind of cherry-picked from a much bigger story. Biographers always love their subjects unless they're writing about a really, really nasty person. We do have a reader question now from Jim Nelson on Google, and this ties into the pinhole. I was a little disappointed they stopped short of reminding us how the pinhole camera is a good, cheap, safe way to view our amazing star. I think that's what made me want to be an astronomer when I was a kid. Who wants to talk about a pinhole camera, a camera obscura, and uh, cave paintings, perhaps even? Surely somebody in this group has built a pinhole camera. Because the question is, has everybody in this group built a pinhole camera? Yes. We yes. essentially did something like that at the solar eclipse in November. Um, poked a bunch of holes in a piece of paper, and then you could see the crescent sun um, as, well, the sun as it was blocked by the moon, so it appeared to be a crescent sun. Um, but it much safer way, but it gets a tiny little image um, when you're that far. We only did it about a foot off the ground. but. It was pretty neat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've done the same, um, I think, years and years ago when I was still in Puerto Rico and there was uh, some, uh, I think, an annual eclipse. And it was the same thing. We didn't really understand how it works. I, was, I think I was eight. But it was neat to see it, to see it work. And, and it does seem kind of like magic, you know, to be like, oh, oh, a little hole. And you can say, oh, wow. And the show didn't really get into it too much. I mean, they showed... They show the light beams that kind of crisscross, and so the thing shows up upside down on the wall, and they, they talked about it just kind of surfacey a little bit. And I don't know, the cave, the cave painting thing I could have done without a little bit. I thought it was a little... Uh, we, we know the cave people existed, and we know the paintings, and that I didn't think we had to go through them to get to everything else. But, you know, it took up some time, and it was pretty enough animation, so you can't complain. And it did get across how like weird and interesting it would be, I guess, is, is a valid point, too. But, I mean, everyone else who used it also seemed pretty impressed, just like me when I was a kid. So. 
Okay, here's another question, and we're going to get into some of our light and some of our physics here. And Liz, I think you were thinking about this question earlier. At the beginning of the episode, Neil deGrasse Tyson talked about light as a photon particle in most of the episode. He then talked about it as a wave. What in the heck is going on? Will light make up its mind? Light has a dual personality. It behaves as a particle at some scales and as a light wave at others. Um, this was a discovery, well, scientists have thought that light behaved as a wave for a really long time. Um, I'm going to share a couple images here. Um, one of the main ways, or one of, one of the main reasons is, um, now I lost my screen, sorry. I hope you guys are all seeing. We can see it. Okay, cool. So this is the double slit experiment. Basically, when you shine a source of light through two slits, um, you will end up seeing kind of this interference pattern, and it is a result of wave wave um, activity in light. So any place where the, those crests cross each other, you get more light, and if they both are in the valley, you'll get no light. Um, also, if you end up getting a crest and a valley at the same time, they'll completely cross each other out. So this was an experiment in the 1800s um, that scientists used to realize that, yes, light sure does act as a wave. And then they ended up doing another experiment um, Actually, one very famous Albert Einstein did this experiment, um, which is now known as, it's known as the photoelectric effect. The idea is that when you toss a bunch of light onto a metal surface, you see some electrons coming off. Okay, so if you put a much stronger source of light at that metal surface but the same color, scientists expected if wave acts or if light acts as a wave that you would just get more electrons. Um, or or you'd get stronger a stronger signal um, and uh, or stronger energy. What happened is it wasn't a stronger energy that was released. It was more electrons. And the reason is because these you're still using the exact same color of light, um, which will end up corresponding to the energy that the electron. Um, that leaves is, if that makes sense. Um, so this experiment, photoelectric effect, 1906, um, Albert Einstein showed that this, that light does have a matter, does behave as matter at some scales and at some energies, and we already know it behaved as, as waves. Um, we got to see sort of, I guess, more of the wave-like patterns uh, in the episode on Sunday and yesterday. I don't, does anyone have any better way of explaining? Well, well it, it, the reason it's hard to explain is because it's a very weird concept because it's not something that we see or experience on, on human scales. Um, but just as, you know, we think, you know, historically people thought about light as a wave, but it kind of has behaviors like a particle. But the, the flip side is things that we think of as particles, like protons, neutrons, electrons, um, also have wave-like behavior. Um, what happens is if, when you get all the way down to the to the atomic and subatomic scale, down to the quantum scale, um, basically their waves and particles are not different things. Uh, waves are particles, and particles are waves. And so, uh, you know, if, if if your question is, can light make up its mind? The answer is no, it cannot. It it, it you know, but just by its very nature, it's both. And actually, there's a there's another moment in this last episode of Cosmos where you see the electron going around the proton in a hydrogen atom, and you know if you if you watch it, it makes this with this weird sort of wavy dance. That's because um, when the electron goes around the proton, it's not orbiting like a planet around a star. It's actually making a wave pattern around the hydrogen atom because the electron is a wave, um, and you can actually and those interference patterns that you did with light, you can do those with electrons. You can actually get uh, interference patterns with electrons. Uh, now, in principle, you can keep doing this. You know, 
you, you know, I'm, I'm made of atoms. My atoms are made of protons, neutrons, electrons, and those things are made out of quarks. You know, basically, I'm a whole bunch of particles, which means I'm a whole bunch of waves. In theory, you know, there, there is some wave-like aspect to me and to you and to everything else around you. That, uh, but it, the, the more, the bigger and the more massive a thing is, the smaller the wave aspect is. Um, Light has no rest mass. You can't stop a particle of light and, and weigh it. It only exists in motion. Um, so light is sort of dominated by the by the wave aspect of its behavior. Um, we are totally dominated by the particle aspect of our behavior. But really, we're a little bit wave-like, and light is a little bit particle-like. And all radiation exhibit both particle-like um, properties and wave-like properties. And when you go to lower energy or radio waves, they end up being a little bit more radio or wave-like, whereas gamma rays and x-rays, which are much higher energy radiation, um, all related to light, visible light that we can see, but at different ends of the spectrum, uh, those gamma rays and x-rays behave a bit more like particles. Yeah, I mean, here, here's, I mean, here's one experiment that I do sometimes I, that I try to demonstrate to my kids. Um, if you're driving the car uh, in the city and you're tuned into like a, a weak FM radio station, um, you sometimes hear you know cut cut in and out as you drive. And yeah, I, I live in New York where the, where there's a, there are a lot of buildings. There's a lot of interference with signals, and so sometimes you know you'll be coming to a, to a red light as you're slowing down. The, you hear the radio station cutting in and out. You can actually roll the car. You can you can you can sort of you can drive your car, you know, inch it up foot by foot and hear the station come in and cut out because you're actually passing through the interference pattern of the radio waves and you can measure the wavelength of a radio wave by seeing how far you have to drive to get the radio station back in and I actually tested it and it took about, you know, it took about, you know, five feet to get the radio station back in and I did a back of the envelope calculation. In fact, you know, the wavelength of the, that radio wave is about ten feet. Uh, so I actually was driving through the interference pattern of a, of a radio wave and you can you can experience it it's real it's, you know, this isn't this isn't just a this isn't just an idea or a theory this is something you can experience firsthand so often we think of these things as theoretical or conceptual this is what's really going on in the universe in us and all around us too and a very important point um, and do we want to talk about uh, this guy Heisenberg and his uncertainty principle when we're talking about about uh, electrons and where they are. Well, I think it relates to to the wavy that wavy um, pattern of the electrons circling the or spiraling around the nucleus. Um, Heisenberg uncertainty principle basically just says the more the better you know something's location, the less better you know its movement, um, or the better you know the movement, the less better you know its position. You can't know both of those things extremely well. And why do these elect, there's also a question, why do these electrons automatically want to jump down to their lowest state of energy all this, the time? Sorry, I'm going to take this one because it really weirded me out. Um, so as, as Neil Tyson said, we don't know why they want to jump back down. And my husband, who also has a physics degree, and myself look at each other and we're like, no, they, they go back down because they want to be at their, their lowest energy state. That's what we're taught in physics classes. Um, and it's sort of like, well, that's why, but is that really the main question as to why? Is there something more fundamental than all science says it is so, and therefore it is so? All right, I'll pass it off to one of you guys now. No, I, 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 I love that question because it is one of those things that, that just forces you to step back and wonder why the world is the way it is. Um, you know, we all know that you know, you know, water flows downhill. Everything always wants to seek out its lowest energy level. Um, you know, you know, hot things cool off. Uh, that's just the way the world is. And you know, you know, we, we all know that there's conservation of energy. Energy can't be created or destroyed. Um, we all know that the there, the speed of light is an unbreakable limit, and then you know. But you can demolish, you know, you can demolish any kind of knowledge of physics by just asking why over and over again. Because sooner or later you get to the point of, well, why is the speed of light the way it is? Because that's the way our universe is constructed. <laughs> uh, 
why you know why why does why does everything you know why does why do atoms always tend to their ground state? Why, you know, why does water always flow downhill? That's just the way it is. That's how it works. I think Louis C.K. had an interesting uh, bit based on this. That is like little girl kept asking why, and then you explain it why, and then he'd explain the next level. Why? And then he'd say, like, three hours later, you're having some philosophical crisis. Because some things are, and other things are not. And you can't have something that is, isn't, and you just get too deep into things. And that's, I love, that's like a great, you know, I didn't think too much about it because I, I might not have my mind in, in the classical training of electron shifts the way Liz does. But when she mentioned, yeah, that's true, that's what I heard, is that it, they dropped to the lower state. Fine. But why should we accept that? Kind of goes back to the whole, you know, question everything. Why is that the case? Well, because science says so. Is there a better answer? I mean, sometimes there isn't. But, you know, what if there is? Well, let's talk a little bit about Josef von Fraunhofer, who we got to befriend. And, and poor guy, he grew up and made these fabulous optics, and it basically cost him his life in his, you know, the end of his 30s. Uh, and even after, you know, un unassociated with having a house fall in on you. But, uh, you know, the really incredible thing was that in 1814, when he was still quite young, he, of course, he invented the spectroscope. And light, as Neil said in the episode, and we all know, is really the messenger of so much of the information, of practically all of the information that we know, uh, if you're including the whole electromagnetic spectrum uh, about objects in the universe. Let's talk a little birth of astrophysics, uh, the sort of early birth. It really wasn't until late in the 19th century that things really started cooking with astrophysics. But uh, that really was a seminal moment in, in terms of the primitive astronomy or the theoretical astronomy or the old astronomy that had grown out of astrology, finally getting a physical tool to explore all over the universe and really catalog objects, understand stars and motions and chemistry and, and everything. Um, so, Corey, I know you wanted to talk about uh, our young mirror maker. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so, I mean, so Cosmos uh, necessarily you know, compressed a lot of history together. Uh, so there's re there's really you know there's about a 50 year period between uh, the, the the discovery of these strange dark lines in in the spectrum of the of the sun and other objects and a, if you know a full understanding that these these dark lines are connected you know they're basically they're they're fingerprints they're they're uh, they're bits of missing light that are produced by by different chemical elements and. You know, if you look at the pattern of dark, of dark lines, it will then tell you exactly what that thing is made of. Uh, so, you know, the, from from Fraunhofer, I mean, what Fraunhofer, yeah, Fraunhofer never really quite figured out what those lines were. It was really, you know, it was almost 50 years later when uh, when uh, Robert Bunsen and and Gustav Kirchhoff uh, figured out. They actually they made the explicit connection. They realized, oh, these these lines are the chemical lines. Uh, you know, they are the same things as the as the as the, ke the chemicals that we see in the laboratory, and that I think you know it's it's a somewhat obscure discovery, but I think that is, in some ways, one of the most profound discoveries in the entire history of science, because that was the moment where you could really really prove that the stars are made out of the same things that we are, that you know galaxies at the other end of the universe are made out of the same things that we are. Um, you can you can look, at, you know trillions and trillions of miles away and tell the temperature of a distant planet, what it's made out of. Um, you know, it, it's, the, it's the tool that we use actually for finding planets around other stars, of looking at how, the, of how the, those lines move back and forth uh, based on the, the motion of the stars in response to their planets. Uh, you know, the, entire, I mean, the entire connection uh, between the way chemistry works here and the way uh, the, the way the laws of physics work here and the rest of the universe, you know, New Newton took one big step of figuring out universal gravitation, but really spectroscopy met, in some ways was a much more powerful second step because it told you not only that, yeah, everything's kind of like, you know, operating on the same rules of how, to, of how things bounce around, but actually we are all made of the same stuff. And if we're going to find life on another planet, 
that's probably how we're going to find it, is through spectroscopy. And it's kind of funny, if you think about it, uh, everybody, even not in science, has a passing familiar familiarity with Newton. He's, his is one of those names that everybody gets out there. And gravity is, again, a concept that most people have at least heard of. But <laughs> something like spectroscopy is not, uh, that's not the case at all. And when you put it that way, and, and the show, I think, did a good job at the end of making clear what a big deal this was, even if, even if they didn't necessarily make clear who, you know, was responsible for, for that part of it. But thanks to understanding this nature of light and being able to find the fingerprints in it, we can, the whole universe makes sense in a fundamentally different way than it did before. And that does seem like quite an important step. And, it, you know, it's funny that most people don't get a chance to, to hear that in, you know, your high school science class or whatever, when, I don't know, to me, the science behind chemistry lines and spectra isn't necessarily much more complicated than the science behind gravity. And, the, I mean, everybody, yeah, okay, things fall. But also everything, there's light everywhere. It, it doesn't seem, I don't understand why that disparity exists. Well, let's go to some other questions that have come in that we have here. Um, let me see. I have a uh, question about atomic orbitals. Or orbitals. In the program, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson mentions that at the atomic levels, things get crazy. Electrons move closer and farther apart from the proton. In the animation, it's depicted as teleporting from one spot to another. Was just just shown to illustrate how crazy the electrons move, or does this really happen? <laughs> well, at the uh, so so back to the idea that, that the, the you know the, the, of the electron is kind of this wave dancing around uh, the the nucleus of the atom. Um, the electron can only be in certain places because it has to make a certain number of waves as it goes around, so it can make you know, two waves or three waves or four waves, that, that allows only certain paths that the, the, of where the electron can be, or basically only, only, only certain energy levels where the electron can be, um, because it's kind of, re it's restricted by its, own, by its own quantum nature, that it can only be in, in certain places. So when an electron, let's say, absorbs a photon, absorbs a particle of light, and it jumps up to a higher orbit, um, then... Yeah, basically, at, th at that moment of absorption, it is it, its its wave pattern is changing, and uh, there's a th there's actually a f there's a field of physics called femtochemistry. Um, it's actually basically watching the way that light interacts with atoms at ex very very high speed. So you can actually kind of watch that process in action because that those interactions between uh, you know between Electrons and photons between between matter and light drives a lot of chemistry. And again, it's a, it's an amazing thing when you think about, you know, you're watching something on on screen on Cosmos, and it seems almost unreal. And yet, then you look out in the scientific literature, and there are scientists who are basically studying those processes and using it to improve chemistry and to you know to Im sort of improve our understanding of the world. Um, so I. I I can't. I can't give an exact time scale on it, but it basically. Uh, I mean, it, it's uh, it's on the order of, you know, I guess a, a trillionth or a quintillionth of a second uh, that it ta that that you know it's within that time interval that the electron changes from one state to another. Okay, okay. here's another question. This is one that you like. How do spectral lines inform us of the motion of of stellar bodies? This is a big one. Liz? So, um, you know, scientists can look out and they see these specific specific lines that relate exactly to what they see in the lab, except they're all slightly shifted a little bit to the red. Um, they first noticed that these lines, let's say, really bright centers of galaxies called quasars about 50 years ago. They noticed that, oh, hey, there's the hydrogen the, the same lines we see in hydrogen, all the spacing's the same, but they're shifted quite a bit over to the red. And this is how scientists actually found out that um, the, the universe is expanding and things are moving 
really, really fast away from us, except for Andromeda, which is going to collide with us in a few billion years, and the rest of the local group galaxies are bound by the gravity within our, um, within, you know, our certain local bubble, lo the local group bubble of about 50 galaxies. Um, but everything beyond that, we can go and see that their lines are slightly shifted, objects that are closer to us, but yet outside the local group have a, a much smaller shift to the red. Things that are a lot farther away have much larger shifts to the red. And scientists use just a mathematical principle to figure out how far away those things are and how fast they're moving. What I thought was interesting about that, I'm sorry, Corey, I'll just say it quickly. Um, I couldn't believe, based on all the sound stuff that had come up, uh, the organ and then the final, the symphony, I couldn't believe that they didn't tie that into the Doppler, you know, yeah. that kind of effect. Like, that is that is something that everybody ever has heard that I always feel like is useful. And maybe the show is just trying to take different paths, and maybe that's why this weird kind of what I call the schizophrenic approach, it doesn't want to take you through the same tour of science that all the textbooks and everything else does, and so it's taking its own way around and showing you the sights in a different order. And so maybe that's why, you know, the sound effect didn't come up. But it seemed like such an obvious thing to mention because I, everybody's heard that, and it really puts into place. The sound itself isn't changing. It's just the waves, you know, shorten and get longer again. So it's the same thing with light. Done. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, like I mean, I think that, I mean this is where you know it, it's it's helpful to think about you know wave you know waves in a pool where you can actually see waves. You know, if you if you uh, you know if you if you see w or waves in front of a the bow of a ship or, or or waves in a swimming pool if you push your hand through the water. And you know when you're when you're moving it forward, the waves sort of pile up and and compress in front of your hand. Well, you know, if sound waves are coming toward you, they pile up and they compress, and the waves get shorter, and shorter waves make a higher pitch. Uh, and the same thing happens with light. If the light is moving toward you, the waves pile up and compress, and it turns bluer. Or if it's moving away from you, they stretch out and it, it turns redder. Well, so, you know, you have these, these lines in the spectrum, which are basically like a barcode. And then what Liz was describing, you know, you know what that whole barcode looks like. You know what it looks like if, it's standing, if you're standing still, if the whole code is shifted one way, you know that the, the object is moving away from you. If the whole thing is shifted another way, you know it's moving toward you. Uh, and the amount of the shift tells you how fast it's going. So that's, you know, that, that simple thing tells you a lot because it basically lets you, it lets you know how are all the stars moving around us? How fast are the planets rotating? Um, are, there, are there planets pulling on other stars? It's how you... you study the gas moving around a, a black hole. In fact, it's, it's one of the ways that we are pretty sure that there really are black holes. Uh, you know, that, that one little tool, I mean, back to what, what Bill was saying earlier, you know, spectroscopy is a sort of a, it's an intimidating and unfamiliar word, but it is such a powerful tool, and when you just think about it, it's basically, you know, nature has put a barcode on everything in the universe, and, you know, once you know how to read it, you can figure out what everything's made of and how it's moving. That's a it's a pretty amazing idea. Okay, here's another one back to some physics of light. Why does light slow down when it moves through a prism? I thought that it was utterly important that light always moves at C, no matter what that is, the speed of light. Okay, who wants to take that? <laughs> Bill? I feel like I've been taking a lot of these physics-y ones, so someone else is welcome to. <laughs> I'll, I'll start in, and then you guys can, can plug up whatever holes I leave. Um, so C, if I recall correctly, is the isn't the speed of light in a vacuum, which is that cosmic speed limit, which is three times ten to the eighth meters per second, or something that rounds out nicely like that. And so that's something that gets left kind of in the footnotes a lot of the time when this speed, the speed of light, is always constant and it's always the cosmic speed limit, and there's nothing to go. They mean in a vacuum. Uh, in other medium, the other media. Uh, light goes at different speeds, and so that's why you could do that famous trick of a pencil in a glass of water. It looks like it kind of breaks in half at the water line because the light that you're seeing bounces off the the pencil and goes through the air at a different rate than it does once it goes through the water because water is a different medium. And so the the prism is also a different medium, so it breaks things up that way 
and in a particular way that helps the light, the different components of the light, as they showed in the show, um, break up and not all go at the same, uh, the same exact speed. And that's why we can see them separately come out as the rainbow as opposed to all together at once, that white light. Is that about right? Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good to me. So, yeah, yeah the, so the thing you have to remember, right, so this, the speed of, the thing we call the speed of light, it's the speed of light when it's not bumping into anything. Uh, as soon as light is moving through, you know, water or a piece of glass, um, the light is bumping into atoms, getting absorbed, re-emitting, re absorbed, re-emitting. So it's not, you know, you, you can sort of think that this light is still moving the speed of light from point to point, but it keeps getting delayed along the way. Um, now, and again, if you just think about it, you know, think about, a, you know, a long, a long wave of light is going to jump over a lot of the atoms. A short wave of light is going to bang into a lot of the atoms. So blue light has a shorter wave, red light has a longer wave. The red light is less likely to bump into the atoms, and so it goes through faster. Bluer light keeps banging into the atoms. It, it goes through slower. And the fact that you know, the, blue, the bluer light gets knocked around more, that's also why the sky is blue. So it all ties together. It's all part of a glorious tapestry. Whoa. The same idea of radiation bouncing into a light, so light, visible light bouncing into the particles in the prism and going at different speeds, therefore, and fanning out, I guess, when you exit the prism. Um, same idea is why radiation that's generated at the sun's core takes a really long time to get out of the sun's surface. It's, you know, tens of thousands of years, I've heard up to 200,000 of years, to, to go from just the central core it bounces along so many different things, absorb, re-emit on its way out of the sun. So, fun little fact of the day. Yeah, that always freaks people out. But then it only takes eight minutes once it leaves the sun's surface. Exactly. Then it's exactly. regular speed of light. Essentially, a I mean, it's not entirely a vacuum, but it's a heck of a lot closer to a vacuum out in space. Okay, here's another question. In Herschel's experiment, why was the red light hotter than the blue light if blue light has more energy? Ah, good question. All right, I, I had to look this one up, too, because I thought it was crazy. Although, Corey, you're about to say something. No, go ahead. Um, basically, uh, red light affects and heats up um, liquids in a way that blue light will just pass through. And... So the water in your body, the water in food, for example, is the same type of idea as a microwave will heat up the water, which then heats up the food. Um, it's, yeah. <laughs> you said what I was going to say. All right. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, the, yeah. The, so the answer is, uh, it, is it, because the uh, the question is absolutely right. That blue light does have more energy than red light, and so. Uh, you, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a quirk of the fact that, you know, water molecules vibrate more, more efficiently in response to red light than to blue light. As you say, you know, the, the, the blue light, you know, if you think about uh, basically, you know, what, you know, the, the different ways you hit a bell to make it ring, uh, the blue light is hitting it, I don't know, too fast. It doesn't actually make it ring. Uh, red light hits it closer to the, to the rhythm that makes a water molecule ring, and so then it can absorb the energy and, and heat up. Um, I just want to put in a quick plug that um, if you look up, uh, if you Google Cool Cosmos on the internet, uh, you'll go to the, the infrared center at Caltech, uh, which is partnered with the, the Spitzer Space Telescope, and they have a whole section of how you can do the Herschel experiment at home and prove for yourself that this, that this really works. Uh, it's a very easy experiment to do, and it's a, it's, a, it's a great thing that you can actually replicate and see exactly how he did it. Fantastic. Well, I wish we had more time, everyone, but we don't. But thanks again for a great discussion today to each of you. Thanks to Bill. Wonderful to be with you again today. Great thoughts. Corey, as always, fantastic. And great history and physics. Liz, thank you so much for being the master of light. And uh, let me just say that... Uh, I also want to thank uh, Celestron, of course, again, for sponsoring us. We're very appreciative of all the support that they give to us. And I'd also like to um, tell you about a special opportunity that you have today as a live viewer. 
uh, for tuning in this week. You can actually go, and let me see if I can do this correctly here. There we go. You can actually go over to astronomy.com uh, slash survey if you'd like to, and you can take a one-minute survey about our Google Hangout and be entered to win a one-year subscription to Astronomy Magazine or an extension, if you're a truly wonderful person and you already get the magazine. But be quick, the survey is only open for about the next half hour. Um, we will be back next week to discuss the sixth episode of Cosmos, which has the obscure title, Deeper, Deeper, Deeper Still. So it will be very interesting to find out what that episode is really all about. We hope that you'll join us. We really enjoyed uh, this this week. We enjoyed the episode of Cosmos, despite all the little discussion that we're having with it, um, you know, about it. I'm sure that we all think that it's a fantastic thing and is doing a great job for astronomy and science. But I want to make a plea to all of the producers of television programs. Please don't say that Voyager is at the edge of the solar system. <laughs> Just don't. Okay? Please. It's not. Okay? <laughs> Thousands of years to get to the Oort cloud, okay? Um, so anyway, thanks for joining us. We really enjoyed having you today. We'll talk next week about all the details of next week's episode, and have a great rest of the week.